So, uh, okay, so uh, today we're going to be uh, seeking to use the time um, as as uh, feasibility allows to um, to go through two topics. First of all, Wade uh, during our last session had had asked uh, a really valuable question about the relationship between functors and profunctors and this idea that uh, profunctors uh, represent a generalization of functors uh, and that um, as such they can, uh, can can serve as as functors or serve as uh, so covariant functors contravariant functors and um, there's a couple different ways one could approach um, answering that and I didn't do a very effective job last time uh, about doing that and um, I wanted to um, to do at least to offer one um, one of the questions sort of a um, a suitable um, answer um, one of the ways one might phrase that question uh, and talk about what some people believe is um, the sort of most um, profound result of category theory, or, or most significant results of category theory, which which has to do with the unite the Uneda lemma. Um, I I had uh, with regret sort of sacrificed these topics, um, even though they have some direct bearing on our discussion of profunctors. And uh, certainly, uh, both the Uneda lemma and the discussion of representable functors have uh, direct bearing on uh, polynomial functors. Um, so while I, with regret, put that aside, stimulated by Wade's question, I want to take that on. And then as time allows, we're going to go into uh, some of the basics uh, associated with polynomial functors. Uh, but realistically we're probably going to have to look to friday to to um, to really start working with that material more more significantly um okay so uh i'm just going to share my screen here and we'll jump in to the uh first of the um the slide decks uh namely that associated with um uh, with uh, coverage of representable functors. Um, so give me a moment. I'm having window dysfunction here. Here we go. Okay. Um, so uh, within this area, I'm going to be providing what I hope will be a very brief glimpse of um, glimpse, but significant, brief, but um, uh, significant and useful. Um, look at this issue of representable functors and uh, how that feeds into the UNA dilemma. Um, this incredibly general result that's at once general, deep, and yet practical, and practical within programming um, as well as, uh, as we'll see within the modeling area with uh, polynomial functors. Um, I'm drawing here on this video I asked you to watch on representable functors with some significant drawing also on this wonderful talk uh, by Jeremy Gibbons um, uh, about the Oneida lemma, which I, I'm gonna suggest you watch for next time because uh, it has some nice code examples uh, applying some of these ideas. Uh, he talks about the relationship, how these ideas to certain degree um, uh, Help, help unify some ideas, or or help demonstrate more powerfully some ideas from profunctor optics, and maybe contributed a little bit to uh, inspiring some aspects of profunctor optics. So um, the key points uh, I want to convey here, or or many of the key points, are as follows: uh, profunctors act as um, as functors. Uh, in their first and separately second position. So if we only consider their first position, they act as um, contravariant functors. Um, this this is, is wrong, this, should, this is the reverse. Uh, first, they're contravariant with respect to their first argument 
and covariant with respect to their second argument. We talk about the first argument being a negative position and, um, and, and the second argument being in the positive position. It reflects the fact that when we're thinking about profunctors in general, we're thinking about the HOM profunctor, which I've written here um, in particular, we're thinking about making a, a B from an A. Um, so if we have P of A comma B, we're thinking about consuming an A, using an A to get a B or getting to where we're at an A so we can make a B. And therefore it's positive we produce a B, we require an A to do the work. So we talk about that being in, in the negative position and it's, it's contravariant as we've seen from profunctors. Um, we need to, to take the bus to our friend's house across town, we need to get from where we currently are to the bus stop, not the bus stop to us. Representable functors are functors uh, that um, exhibit natural isomorphism um, uh, with, um, with this for some A. And you can actually phrase these with co-presheaves or presheaves, um, depending whether it's, um, uh, C optoset or, or C to set. These are, are functors here. This is going to be a functor from C to set uh, called a co pre sheaf, um, somewhat confusingly. Um, so if we consider plugging in different values X for this, and we consider, you know, uh, how to get from A to this object or to this other object or to this other object. We could think of that as a functor mapping um, objects, the things that plug in here into sets. In this case, the HOM set of going from A to that object. Um, and this is for a fixed A. Um, it represents an entire functor. All we have to do is specify A and that completely specifies the functor. It says what it does on objects, and it turns out it says what it does on morphisms. Um, we completely specify the functor just by saying, you know, what profunctor it is we want, let's say the HOM profunctor, and what the value of A is. And it'll completely specify the rest of the functor. Um, it's, it's entirely given. And that's called a representative functor, and anything that's naturally isomorphic to this is called representable. Um, so um, I believe it would also include if it were dash uh, A here, and we consider the, the so-called pre-sheaves from C op to set. Um, so just a single object, known just a single object for a given profunctor will specify this entire functor. We, we can represent it easily with just an object. Um, and it turns out that representable functors are really uh, important. Um, and for us more immediately, like later this lecture, they're going to serve as the building blocks for these polynomial functors. The, the polynomial functors are going to be adding together representable, representables, just to, like in high school, you added together x squared plus x plus one. Um, each of those terms, like x squared, x, and one, uh, here are going to correspond to representable functors. Uh, they're going to be things from a given fixed A to different possible objects um, or different possible sets in this case. Um, and the innate dilemma is this remarkable result, remarkable because of its power, its generality, its, its theoretical significance, its utility in many spheres, and its practicality. It's it, the fact it can be really useful as, as uh, as uh, Jeremy Gibbons' talk will, will show you. It's a remarkable result that formalizes the notion that at a philosophical level, uh, everything about an object is summarized by its connections. As uh, Bartosz or Jeremy Gibbons has called it, recalls that old English saying, uh, one knows a person by the company they keep. Um, so we, we can know everything about a given object here by its relationship with others. If we know about the relationships with other objects, we know about the essence of that object. 
Okay, so just to illustrate this, uh, to cut to the chase here, um, to, to address one way one could approach Wade's question, which is um, uh, to, to, what, to what degree is um, uh, a, a functor really, um, uh, really achieved by, uh, by a profunctor? To what degree does the profunctor act as a functor? Uh, if one approached it from that direction, rather than about every functor being captured by profunctors, but how can we make, uh, to what degree does a profunctor act as a functor? Well, it acts as a functor in, its, in each of its arguments, covariant and contravariant. This is the covariant form. So I, I'm putting this dash, and, and it takes a bit of getting used to, but basically you could think of that as just saying, um, plug in the value into this. Um, it's a little bit like in Scala, we, we put a under bar here. Um, say like, I, I'm getting the, the value, um, uh, I'm, I'm, it's like I've got a lambda that takes an, an argument here. So here, um, this is gonna serve as a functor. We're, we're having, we're considering C, this is the Hom profunctor. So profunctor takes two arguments. Um, and yet the first argument here is fixed, it's A, that's this object within C. And what we're asking for through this is about, uh, if we plug in different objects for the second argument, we're asking about the Hom set between A and these things. So if we plug B in here, we consider all morphisms between A and B, the set of all those morphisms is the value of this uh, for C comma A, sorry, C of A comma B. Uh, if we were to plug C into here, this guy down here, this object, see the object, um, this would constitute the Hom set consisting of these morphisms. Uh, and, uh, what this is suggesting is that if we plug in successive objects here, we get sets, HOM sets. CAA is just none other than the HOM set of A to itself. So this is a functor. If you plug in different objects for each object, it maps over to another category, which is set, and maps each object to an object here. The objects in set are predictably sets. So each object is mapped to an object in set. Each object is mapped to a set, the Hom set, uh, linking up the object A to that object. Um, so A is mapped to CAA, which consists of just the ID um, morphism. B is mapped to CAB which is the hum set of things between A and B, J, H, G, okay? And C is mapped to C, A, C, which is this hum set we talked about, okay? Um, but we know functors act on more than objects. They act on morphisms. What does this thing do on morphisms? Well, let's consider a morphism here, say from B to, to C. So we call this morphism F. We can lift that with this functor as well. Uh, and you get CAF. Well, what, it, what in the world does CAF mean? Well, what it means is uh, something that takes in an object X, uh, excuse me, it takes a morph, it's a morphism, and, and a morphism in set is a, a function. So here it takes in. So this is a, a function. It takes in a function and it, it basically uh, creates a function which consists of that function we took in post-composed by F. So it runs F after this, okay? So um, that, this is uh, a function that's, uh, that's created here. Uh, and uh, this function, is the results uh, of post-composing. And how does that work? Well, you'll notice it's um, what it's composing with. These X's are, are basically uh, these guys uh, here. So 
So we are those over here be JHG, for example. Uh, and so what we get out here, so, so the set here, uh, CAB is JHG, that's, that's a set. This object B got mapped to this object, which is a set JHG listing these morphisms here. That's the HOM set from A to B. That's what B got mapped to, the HOM set from A to B. Okay. And CAF maps this set, CAB, into this set, CAC. How does it do that? Well, it takes each of these items, that's the X, like J, and it composes F with that. So for J, we get F after J. For H, we get F after H. For G, we get F after G. But big picture, CAF maps this set, CAB, into CAC. Now, there's something deeper going on here. And I like how Bartosz explains it, how Jeremy Gibbons explain it. Um, excuse me, how uh, Brendan Fong explains it in, um, uh, in the uh, program with Categories course. So we can kind of think of this picture showing, how does B view A? The view of A from B. That's what this HOM set gives. Uh, this HOM set from A to C gives the view of A from C, kind of the perspective on A from C. It's the perspective on A from B. And F, transforms the perspective on A from B into the perspective on A from C. So B is this perspective, and in order to get the perspective from C on, on A, and it, in order to get the perspective on C on A, we just, uh, we just use F here. We lift F um, to get that. Uh, so, so that's what this functor does and, and lifting F with this functor basically gives us this way to turn perspectives on A from B into perspectives on A from C. Um, and uh, we, could, we could argue similar things about, um, about these other arguments here. So lifting of morphisms by this functor provides ways of kind of transforming uh, perspectives. So we can transform one perspective into another perspective with this functor. Uh, and you could think of this functor evaluated on objects, uh, this contravariant functor um, that we're just varying the second argument of what's a pro functor as as providing perspectives from certain objects of some fixed object here, A. Okay. Um, so you should get used to this idea of doing this from a, a fixed object because it's gonna be useful in the next slide and it's gonna be useful in the innate dilemma. Okay, uh, by contrast, so this is a covariant functor um, here to transform from a perspective on A from B into a perspective on A from C, we apply, we lift an F that goes from B to C. That will let us go from perspective on A from B into a perspective on A from C. Mm. Mm. Um, okay, uh, let's go to, whoa, sorry. Sorry, um, uh, mumble. I'm trying to get rid of um, this uh, this thing again. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so so that was covariant to transform from the perspective from B on A to the trans to the perspective from C on A. Uh, we apply an F that goes from B to C. By contrast, this other one, where we're considering arguments of objects, morphisms, in the first argument, this is contravariant. We have a similar idea here, but to transform from a perspective 
uh, on um, from involving B to a perspective involving C, uh, we we actually need a, a morphism here from C to B. Okay, now this one's a little bit confusing to to think about. Um, uh, I find it. Um, you'll notice that. Uh, I've drawn this one uh, in C here, and I've drawn this one in C on the left as well. I could have driven, could have drawn it in C op, uh, would have been another possibility. But the salient difference between them is here I'm showing C, the arrows are going from A to B. It's the perspective on A from, from B. It's kind of brought via these arrows from here. This is kind of A's perspective on B. This is A's perspective on C and this new functor here. Um, and here we're, we, we have a, a somewhat similar thing. We, I mean, certainly it's similar how it acts on objects. Um, you know, C, B, A uh, represents the perspective uh, on a, uh, excuse me, uh, A's perspective on B. Uh, so it's where A is kind of viewing B. This is A's perspective on C. And if we want to transform A's perspective uh, uh, on B into an A's perspective on C, we use F. But F here is going in the opposite direction. It's going from C to B. Um, it's, it's going in that contravariant direction. So to transform this perspective uh, on B from A into a perspective on C from A, we use this, we lift this morphism, which is in the reverse direction. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the contravariance that comes up when you're making that omelet, right? And you've got to do something before the omelet, like crack the eggs and wash the, the cilantro. Um, so that's going to allow you to perform uh, a transformation. Uh, so here um, uh, we're viewing B from A and we want to get to something that's viewing uh, A from C instead. And we need a morphism that goes from, from C to B to be able to sort of work upstream from B uh, to C. Okay, um, so that's gonna let us kind of translate this perspective on B into a perspective further out into to C as it were, something along those lines. Um, uh, okay, um, so here's a pro functor operating as a covariant functor lifts objects uh, to objects, namely sets, lifts morphisms to morphisms, sets. Uh, the lifting of a given object is the perspective on that object uh, from, um, excuse me, perspective on the fixed object A from that object. Um, and uh, lifting morphisms lets us transform these perspectives on A so we could see A from different angles. Here, um, we have the perspective from A on different objects. And once again, lifting a morphism lets us transform perspectives, but it's in a contravariant way. So these are called representable functors. These are kind of the canonical representable functors. All we have to do is plug in a value for A, if we know our pro functor, all we do is we plug in a value for A and we've completely specified a functor here. This is a complete functor. All I have to do, if I know I'm working with, um, with a given pro functor, here the home pro functor, C, all I have to do is specify an A and I've got myself a complete functor. Um, that this functor is entirely specified just by the identity of the object. If I plug B in here, I'd get a different functor here. I, I get a, a, you know, it would map to different sets. Um, but those sets would be completely determined by the identity of this object. 
if I had plugged in C here um, as kind of the, the, the root object, as it were, um, the focal object, the object from which we are viewing or which we are viewing from different per, uh, other perspectives. So we can represent this functor with just this minimal of information. Just by specifying one object, we get an entire functor operates on objects, operates on morphisms. Um, and they're always mapping to, to set here. With generalized profunctors, they can map to a V category. Um, we saw some of that earlier, but we're already here with set. Just think about it, this was set. Um, for Haskell, this could be Hask. Um, okay, but these aren't the only representables. For, for each representable like this, the, each of these kind of canonical representables, and, um, this, I'm sure there's a name for them, um, uh, uh, that, that exist like this, it's like CA dash. Um, uh, okay, I should say we're zooming out here. We're zooming out. So far, this becomes a point. This mapping becomes um, uh, a, a, a point here. Um, we're representing this functor uh, as an object in a category. And these arrows between these objects, so these are, this is a functor category. The, the objects are functors from C to set, C to set. So this whole functor becomes, it's like we're viewing it from Mars. It becomes the tiniest of, of, of points. It's this, it's this object here. This is this functor. And this is another functor. And this is another functor. And this is another one. And for no good reason, this is shown in different colors. I, I had my artistic aspirations. Um, um, so, if these are functors, what are these morphisms between them? What, what are structure preserving mappings between functors? Can anyone say? They are what? There's two words in it. Natural transformations. What's a structure preserving mapping between a functor, one functor and another? Oh, I think you know. Did you hear Can you Wade? It? Can you hear us? Structure preserving mapping between functors, a well behaved mapping between functors lets us translate the head of the person into the head of a dog. Let's me translate the hand of a person into the hand to the paw of a dog. What is that called? It's a what? Oh, man. Okay, uh, must have put you to sleep. It's called a natural <laughs> transformation. These are natural transformations, folks. When I have a category of functors, the morphisms, as in general for categories, are these structure-preserving things. If we have a, if we have a category of 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 monoids. The morphisms are monoid homomorphisms. Okay, I'll, I'll be with you in just a sec, Alex. Um, if we have a category of, um, of, 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 of small categories, the morphisms are structure preserving mappings between categories, namely functors. Um, if we have a, um, a category associated with functors, they're structure preserving mappings, which are natural transformations. Alex, yes. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, I think I'm not hearing you. I think I think the message that has been conveyed uh, is that I'm not hearing you. Uh, no, I can't. I can't hear you. Um, okay. Now uh, I can hear various bleeps from my computer, but I can't actually hear you. Um, uh, I can hear bleeps from the computer, but I can't bleep and hear you. Um, so, um, uh, okay. Um, 
yeah, maybe I'll just keep this chat window up. Um, I, I, I see that you've answered the question. Uh, okay, awesome. I'm just going to keep the chat window up and we'll avoid the audio debugging till my next, to my address to the graduate student community. Um, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, all on today's work here. Okay, so so we have us we have this category of functors and mappings between them, which are natural transformations. Now, um, some of these functors that are in here, these are all functors from C to set. None of them are functors from D to set. They're all from C to set, and some of them have have not just a natural transformation from this representable to them. They, they actually have a natural isomorphism. They have natural transformations both ways that are isomorphisms. They're, they, and basically, it's, it's just a relabeling of things. It's a reshuffling of things. It's the same information between them. And those are called representables as well. So F is a representable here. J is a representable here, I'm showing because there's a natural isomorphism uh, between those and, uh, and these representable objects. So these are called representable functors and they're beautiful functors. Um, they're well-behaved functors. Um, they're wonderful functors. And um, these, these, uh, these functors are, are called representable functors because they're just relabelings of of these kind of canonical ones, um, where we have a profunctor, we can just specify for a single object. Boom, uh, we specify the entire functor. Um, Alex, did you have a question, or is that a sort of residual hand for before? Oh, okay, yeah, there's a hand still up, but I'll treat it as Adam Smith's invisible hand. Um, uh, yeah, I could tell a story about that, but we'll we'll go on. Um, so these are representable things. These are representable functors here. Um, so uh, what's going on with these natural transformations, uh, and in fact, natural isomorphisms be between them? We have something like this. So here's our kind of canonical one, C A dash. This is kind of but the representable is representable. It's a representable functor. We just specify A and we completely specify it in C. So here's C and we have, you know, this maps each object into CA, that object, right? Uh, so A is mapped to CAA, B is mapped to CAB. Mm. Um, so that's one functor. Um, in case you don't recognize it, this is the naturality square, and there should be a big check mark in the middle of it, which I somehow forgot to place here. Um, but this is one functor shown on the thick lines, mapping A to CAA, B to CAB. And so that's that's like showing this functor. And this one down here, uh, oh, oh man, um, if I had been artful, I would have called this G because that's this one here. Uh, that's this here functor, okay? So it maps A to GA, B to GB, um, and it maps F to GF. Um, meanwhile, you know, F up here has been mapped to CAF, this transformation for perspectives on A from A to perspectives on A from B. How do we get from this perspective to that perspective? Um, and this naturality square needs to commute. It needs to preserve that structure. It shouldn't matter whether you go this way and this way or this way and this way. But for a natural isomorphism, it's more than that. It's more than it's just going one way. We have to have an isomorphism in the other way so that, so if we go from this, whoa, 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 whoa I'm lost. Okay, um, this way to this way, it's the same as that way to that way. Um, and if we have this natural isomorphism, um, then, you know, then G here would be representable. Uh, you could think of F as kind of being in that position here. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So um, this is a naturality square um, that operates both ways for a natural isomorphism. Um, okay. Uh, Bartosz has nice coverage of this where he actually, uh, I didn't require or didn't ask you to review this part, but it's actually a bit later in that same video. Um, but basically what he shows is uh, in a very nice way in his representable functors uh, talk that um, certain data structures are representable. Um, and, uh, and basically they're associated with an A. Here's the A, rep F here. It's a type, um, not some higher kind, it's a type. Um, so you could think of this as like int or integer down down here, um, and um, and this is describes morphisms between A and X, um, just like this does for a given object X. Here a type. This describes morphisms or functions in Hask uh, from A to X. Um, that's what that is, and. A representable here has these two, two sort of elements. One that tabulates it, it, it kind of memoizes it, it turns it into this data structure, FX, you know, turns it a container that contains the value. Um, so given a way to kind of compute uh, the value, um, I can I can go and tabulate them. Um, or given, given a tabulation of them, I can always do a lookup function, like a lookup from an integer to an X. And Bartosz does this nice demonstration of how streams are representables, where this A is an integer. Um, so they're, they're representables. Um, uh, and uh, we can, tabulated and indexed uh, in this uh, appropriate way. So this would be the equivalent of representable functors um, within the context of, of Haskell. Okay. Um, now I'm, I, I, somehow the, the chat window has made its way behind. Um, okay, there's no, no new chats there. Okay, so um, I'm gonna have to watch screen real estate here. Um, okay, um, okay, now the Yonei dilemma, um, and I'm, I'm running out of time here, I'm actually over time for this. So the Yonei dilemma is this beautiful result that basically relates things at two very different levels of abstraction. It's kind of remarkable. Um, so these things over here, so the Yonei dilemma has an equation, and the equation is given as follows. So um, if we have a functor, any old functor f, which is a mapping from C to set here. Um, uh, so this would be a co pre sheaf here. Um, and we have any object in this object C from which that functor maps. There's a natural isomorph, there's an isomorphism between these two. Um, between F applied at A at this object. Um, think of maybe F is a, is a functor like list uh, and we apply it at A and A is int. So we give a list of int. Um, or maybe A is, uh, maybe F is maybe and A is bool. And what this is saying is the information in a maybe of bool, which is, if you think about it, three possible values. It could be nothing, or it could be some true, or it could be some false. So the number of possible values of it is equal to, okay, so this is kind of like a data structure, considering the number of values of it is equal to, then. Over on the left-hand side, you've got something at a totally different level of abstraction. You have this mapping in this sort of category, oh my gosh, between functors. Um, it's like the number of 
morphisms here between these functors, um, between CA dash and F. Um, so F here will be like maybe, um, maybe. Um, and we're considering this now for all different, so this could be maybe of int, this could be maybe of double, and we're, we're consist, considering CA int, CA double, CA bool, um, and, and F of bool, and we're considering the mappings between them um, within this, uh, within this context. Uh, th these are, are sort of uh, natural transformations. How many natural transformations are there in this functor category? Where the natural transformations are these natural transformations of this sort. Um, and uh, where in Hask would be the objects here would be different types. Um, so we have natural transformations. The number of natural transformations here between F, like maybe, maybe, and, and uh, for an arbitrary category, for any category you want from C to set, for any locally small category, which is sort of nice categories. Um, uh, well, I, they're my friends anyway. I haven't gotten friends with the big kids yet. You know, the, the big, the, the, the locally big or the globally big or whatever. I, it'll be a long time before I hang around with those kids. Um, so uh, here, uh, these are natural transformations. Saying the, the natural transformations are a one-to-one -one basis with the number of possible values of this maybe a bool. That's kind of weird, isn't it? It's like we're dealing here with, with these things, the number of bits we can have that are different or what have you. And up here, we're dealing with these natural transformations that systematically map for all these different data types, you know, going from my functor uh, here to, um, to, to, this, uh, to this functor. Um, it's, it's kind of a mind-bending thing. But what's even more mind betting is this is actually really useful and it's sensible. Um, and, and uh, you know, I like the way Bartosh puts it here. I think Jeremy Gibbons uses a similar um, characterization. Look, look at in, in, um, in uh, Haskell, this is just for, for different X's um, functions from A to X. Fixed A. Um, um, we can do this for any object and let's see for fixed A. We're considering all mappings uh, for an X and then we're considering over all X's. The mappings from that, the natural, this is a natural transformation, a parametrically uh, defined polymorphic function mapping from this guy into FX. So it might map here uh, A to X. We're considering these functions mapping into, you know, uh, uh, maybe of, 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 of int and maybe of double and maybe of hash table and maybe of stream and maybe of list, et cetera. Um, uh, and we have this, uh, this um, function. The number of possible such mappings, oh, sorry. Um, is is equivalent number to this. Um, okay, so this is bringing it a little bit more closer to you, but let's let's think about it this way. Um, um, okay, so here we have that statement here. Um, and it, it turns out there's there's method to this madness if you if you really think about it. So so let's think about, okay, so we're saying these two are equivalent. The information in both of them are the same. Given this, I can give you one of these. Given one of these, I can give you this. Okay, that seems implausible. Um, uh, let's take our mind down from this lofty area of natural transformations and bits to, to just think about it this way. If I give you this, you should be able to give me that. Or if I give you this, this one. Okay, well, let's, let's think about these things. Um, uh, so 
maybe we'll first go, despite the ordering here, maybe I'll say, um, uh, if I have uh, an f of a, um, how can I get one of these things to the left here? Well, okay, I have one of these f of a's here. Um, okay, I don't know if you can see this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of move this guy around. Um, if I have one of these f of a's, oh, sorry, oh gosh, hey, hey, oh man, this is okay. A computational dysfunction. If I have an f of a, how can I get one of these guys? Well, well, let's think about it. Um, so if I have an f of a, um, and then uh, basically what I can do is I can define a function, um, which uh, I'll call alpha, okay? Um, uh, alpha is uh, some function and, um, it's going to take in, alpha will represent this function. We'll call this function alpha, okay? So I have an f of a and I wanna turn it into one of these functions. So I need to define what this function is. Riddle me that, define me this function. Well, okay, so I have this f of a. So this function alpha, it operates on a first argument that's a function, let's call it h. And what's the type of H? Well, it's, it's given to us. That much is handed to us. It's A to X, where X is, has to remain polymorphic. A is some fixed thing, like integer or something like that, or double or whatever, uh, some fixed type. Okay, so H, the argument here, that, that's, uh, that's going to be of this type. Because I'm trying to define this function, it takes an argument of, of this type. So, so H is that. No, that, that much is fixed. So I have alpha H. What is alpha H going to be? Well, all it's going to be is, well, look, if I have an F of A and I need to get an F of X and I have a way of turning A's into X's, wait a minute, I, I can just map each of these A's into a X, to an X. And I, I just map it over this. F is a functor. Um, with a capital F, no less. And so all I do is I map this function over f of a, and I get an f of x. I, I, I f map it. I lift, I lift this function to apply it to an f of a, and I get an f of x. I just f map it. And that f maps uh, over f of a to get f of x. So, so like this way, yeah. If, if you give me one of these, I can give you one of those. Sure, all I do is if, if, if I have one of these, man, if I take one of the things, convert A's into X's, I'm home free. I can get an F of X, just, just lift it to apply to it. Okay, no problem. Okay, so yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, how about this other way though? Um, given one of these, how am I gonna get, how am I gonna produce an F of A? If you give me one of these, how, how can I, how can I produce that? Well, it turns out in a weird way, it's just as easy. It's, it's just as like, yeah, okay, I could, I could do it. So, so let's suppose we have one of these. This is given, right? We have one of these and we wanna produce one of these. So what do we have? We have this alpha, I'm gonna call it alpha. Um, it's the same basic construct. Here we had to define alpha, here we're given alpha, here we, got this and we were trying to find this. Here we're, we're given this. This is what we have up front. So for any x, we can turn, uh, we have this function which will take in an a to x. For any a to x, it'll take it in and it'll produce an fx. How can we get an fa? Well, it's a silly little trick. It's called the Oneida trick. Um, and it's super useful and you see it in weird places. You see it in other places too. Okay. So if I have this alpha given to me, this black box, as it were, that I can pass in any darn mapping I want from A to X, it's for A to whatever X, and I'll get back an F of X. I could pass in a mapping from A to A. And this, this black box will spit out for me well, X, A is a legitimate X, so it'll spit out for me an F of A, and I'm done. So I just give it alpha ID. 
you know, where ID is mapping A to A. And so if, if I have this magic box, this black box that could take in any stinking function for any X and give me an F of X, I just give it a function A to A and it'll give me an F of A and I, I'm done. Okay, so, so going this way, it's also like a one-to-one -one mapping. Now, what I haven't shown here and what I'm not going to show is that these are inverses of one another, that they, that if you compose one with the other, that, um, you know, you, you, it's the identity, um, but it turns out that it is true. So, so this weird factoid, this, this thing, which basically says that there's the same information in a data structure as in these natural transformations. The natural transformations have the same information packed into them, this set of natural transformations. When you really come down to what's the information in it, it's the same as this, you know, the number of possible values of this data structure, which seems totally implausible. At a programming level, it starts to seem more plausible that we can, we can carry a tabulated version of this, or we can carry a version where it's kind of computed in this sort of way. Um, and we can go back and forth between them, okay? Um, so that's, that's UNADA. And I may expand more on the UNADA lemma. There's UNADA embedding, which is also kind of cool. Um, but what I'm gonna request you do is, is go and look at um, Jeremy Gibbons video, because it's pretty neat. And he goes through some of the reasoning for this, um, but he also gives a set of practical programming examples which make use of this. Um, so that's UNADA, and that is um, uh, the, uh, the, the representable functors. These functors that we can represent the entire functor by just one piece of information about the object, and boom we specify the entire functor or natural transformations to those canonical ones, uh, natural isomorphisms uh, to these uh, between these canonical ones. I'm going to stop.